Good morning. Welcome here to Dalewood Baptist Church. We're so delighted that you joined us today uh, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm the pastor here, and I'd love to have a chance to meet you if we've never met before. Um, but when we've gathered again to worship Jesus, and so we want to remember that this is a special time in the history of our city. And a month, a year ago, so many things changed for us. A tornado hit our uh, city on March 3rd, and then later on March uh, 15th, our whole city and the whole world shut down. And so one of the things we want to do over the next uh, month is we want to remember this before God uh, together. And so we're going to do that some in our worship services, but I'd encourage you to spend time just praying through this with the Lord. To open up our, script, our, uh, ser- our worship service today, I want to read Psalm 99. So if you would listen, uh, for this is God's word to us. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He's exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You've established equity. You've executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we draw near to you this hour, we are reminded of your glory. Um, You uh, created all things for your glory, and we continue to exist and live and move and have our being in you for your glory. And so, Father, I pray that we would remember uh, the events of this past year and month before you now, of your mercies, uh, of the challenges and the trials. But nevertheless, God, we look to you for kindness. We look to you for mercy and love now. Father, uh, uh, we come to you now, as we always do, confessing our sins. We uh, confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and the things that we've done and the things that we've left undone. We've not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we confess this, God, uh, not because we want to start on a sour note, but rather because we confess our sins because you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And so, Father, I pray that you would be glorified in all that we do and say over the next hour as we give our tithes and offerings, as we um, pray prayers, as we hear from your word, as we proclaim your glories in song. We pray you'd be glorified in all that we say and do. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Amen. Well, as Ryan said, we're so glad that all of you have joined us this morning for worship. We're going to sing a few songs together, so let's go ahead and stand. Wherever you are, whether you're here in the worship service or whether you're at home, we'd love for you to stand and join us as we sing. So let's stand and sing these songs together. Sing this with me. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains move. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus has overcome. Mercy triumphed. When the third day dawned, darkness was denied when the stone was gone. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in 
your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. One more time. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be Let's continue to sing together. If we haven't met before, my name is Jonathan. This is Lindsay, and we're so glad you've joined us, like I said earlier. So let's continue to sing together. Water, you turned into wine. Sing this with me. Water, you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our 
Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Let's sing that one more time. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. If you would remain standing for the reading of God's Word, our sermon today, as we continue our series through the book of 1 Peter about living in exile. Uh, our sermon text today is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, uh, li- living out Christ's victory in exile. So uh, once you've found your place in God's holy and perfect word, again, if you would remain standing for the reading of God's word, 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 11. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge both the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they may live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be long glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and let us pray. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word uh, and through your servant Peter. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. When most of us were growing up, we learned to differentiate between the ancient and perhaps more contemporary era by the designation B.C., that is before Christ, and A.D., which is the Latin phrase Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. Uh, This dating system originated in medieval Europe, which was a largely Christianized continent at the time. And, you know, modern dating attempts to the birth of Christ show that this may have been we technically think of maybe as 2 or 3 B.C., but uh, again, the specific year isn't the most critical thing. It's just that we mark time according to the birth of Jesus, or at least we did. Now, marking time by Christ's birth is helpful, but we have to realize that Christians are not the only people who keep time. And one way we can detect a drift away from Christianity in our culture today is that uh, whenever we refer to B.C., now we add a letter afterwards, which is E. Uh, It's no longer B.C. before Christ, it's B.C.E. before the Common Era. A.D. is no longer used, it's now C.E., which is just referring to the Common Era. It shows that society no longer marks time with regards to Christ. still use the same numbers, but they make a different reference point. And this shouldn't frighten us too much. There have always been alternative calendars. Uh, Jews have always uh, marked time by according to when the rabbis determined the earth was created. So this is year, not 2021, but 5781. Or Islam uh, and Muslims have their own calendar, and this is the year 1442, uh, which would be dated according to our. Um, they date that according to when Muhammad fled Mecca to Medina, and so uh, we would have dated that at 622 AD, uh, but that was for them year one, so this is now 1442 AD. Uh, China has its own dating system, but depending on who you ask, it's a different year. Depends on the Chinese dynasty you count it by. So it could be uh, 4718, 4719, or 4658. Now, which letters come after 2021? I don't want that to, we shouldn't set off to fight another culture war because of that. Uh, But I want us to do think about the greater difference that it signifies, which is that 
We live in a world that does not universally acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. Indeed, it never has. Even if a good portion of the population did, it certainly wasn't the fact for everyone. And so as we think about our lives in exile, citizens of the kingdom of God, living in a world that does not follow or have allegiance to Jesus, uh, we live as AD people in a CE world. And this really isn't that different from the earliest of Christians, Right? The saints of old believed in the triumphant victory of Jesus Christ, that God sent his son into the world to die for our sins, to raise again from the dead, and to ascend with him on high. The Holy Spirit has transformed them, their lives are changed forever, and they've put away their former sins. And as 1 Peter 1.18 would say, we've been ransomed from the futile ways of our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The reconciliation with God was very precious, but living in fellowship with God means that you fall out of fellowship with the world, right? They were living A.D. lives, these early Christians, in a B.C. world, in a world in which Christ had yet to be proclaimed, and this brought with it tension. And in the midst of that tension, we remember Peter's remarks at the beginning of this section of 1 Peter in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul, keeping your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Despite the tension that exists with the world, Peter wants uh, his church, the Christians to know this, that Christ's victory enables us to withdraw from evil and to pursue love and the life of the Spirit for the glory of the Father. Christ's victory enables us to withdraw from evil and to pursue love and the life of the Spirit for the glory of the Father. Well, the first thing that Peter encourages them to do is to live out Christ's victory in the world, to live out Christ's victory in the world. And the first way they do this is by, willing, by being willing to suffer rather than to sin. Look at verse 1. Peter says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Throughout the letter, Peter has made reference again and again to the sufferings of Jesus and how you and I as Christians, we might experience suffering in our lives as believers. He's not talking about the boneheaded suffering that we experience whenever we do something idiotic, right? The Proverbs speaks about that. He's not talking about the suffering that you and I experience in the normal warp and woof of life, the suffering due to age or illness and sickness. The Bible does talk about that. But here, Peter's talking about suffering specifically related to following Jesus Christ, And he says that we need to arm ourselves with this way of thinking. Uh, That is, that we are following Jesus. When we are, uh, we've made this decision to suffer rather than to sin. Look at the second half of verse 1. Peter says, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And this might seem a little strange to us. On the surface, it seems like people who suffer for Jesus aren't sinning any longer. But that would seem to contradict what Jesus himself taught or what John says in 1 John where he says that if anyone says he has no sin, he is a liar and the truth is not in him, even as Christians. It would, so I think that what Peter's actually saying here is that choosing obedience to Jesus and the gospel means that we are willing to suffer rather than sin. Right? If we have to choose between sinning and having an easy life or suffering and following Jesus, we would choose to suffer instead. And since we now resolve no longer to live in sin, Peter says in verse 2 that we live so as to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. As much time as God has given us, we should redeem it, that is, buy it back in order to use it for his glory. Right? Whoever is here today, if you are in Christ, if you're a Christian, you have a, your own personal BC. That is that time in your life before you follow Jesus Christ. But Peter says that having been saved by faith, having been baptized in the name of Jesus, we have a new mission, and it's to not live for our human passions, but rather for the will of God. And I don't think Peter is, when he's referring to God's will here, he's not talking about discovering our life's hidden purpose, right? I'm not saying that that's that's not important, but what he's talking about is that we live God's will to live holy lives in distinction from living sinful lives. If someone were to come to me and say, yeah... I've been praying about it. I'm thinking about hitting up the bank this afternoon to, you know, rob it and make a bank run. But I'm praying about it. 
I would say, listen, I don't actually need to pray about this. Right? Brad Jones is in the house today. He says, no, that's a bad idea. But I don't need to pray about it. That would, be God, that would not be God's will. Okay? <laughs> God tells us not to steal, and so that's outside of God's will. Well, you know, my marriage has been kind of tough recently, and I've met this other person. I'm, I'm really thinking that maybe, uh, you know, maybe I should, I'm thinking about going to be with that person instead. I don't need to pray, brothers and sisters, I do not need to pray as to whether or not that is God's will for your life or not. Because God, if you've been married, he's called you to a covenant marriage for life. He's called you to faithfulness and fidelity. He's not called you to uh, leave our marriages, to abandon them for just so that we can be happy. I'm not saying God doesn't want us to be happy, but I'm saying that uh, we don't have to seek out God's will in those matters. Right? We still need to pray and ask for God to give us guidance and wisdom. But his will is that we should not sin. And this is important because, again, his command of us to follow Jesus puts us at odds with the places specifically where we might, uh, the world might encourage us to live in a different way. And so he's, we've got to be prepared uh, for this because the world will not let us go lightly. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says, the time that is past suffices, it was, it was enough for what the Gentiles, the pagans do. Right, that's referring to anybody who's not a Christian. That living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Right, Peter says, listen, if you have followed Jesus, the time for you to be sinning, that's over now. Right, you've entered into a new chapter. Right, and the chapter is that we uh, submit to the Lord. And he contrasts it with a, with a pagan ethic. Now, this did not characterize every single person's life who didn't follow Jesus in the first century. But what Peter points us to is a lifestyle that is complete with, self, um, with, with a lack of restraint in pursuit of self-fulfillment. A lack of restraint in, to pursue self-fulfillment with food, drink, sex that you consume without regard to what might be appropriate for what God would ordain. Right, we want to make sure, and I, I was talking to uh, someone about this the other day, we want to make sure as Christians that we don't hold up sexual immorality as this one sin that is above every other sin, and that whenever we talk about immorality and decay in society, we're only referring to sex, and how the sexual mores of the world differ from what is portrayed in the Bible. We don't want to make that mistake, but at the same time here and throughout the Bible, that is a big category, right? And we know it's a big category because it's something that so many people fall into temptation on. Right? To accept the sexual attitudes and habits of the world as permissible would be denying what God teaches in his word. However, we still want to engage passionate, compassionately. Right? There might be people who are living in sexual sin and suffering, maybe because of that sin. Maybe because doing that has led others to reject them. As Russell Moore, the Baptist theologian, has said, we as the church have to be prepared to welcome in refugees of the sexual revolution. But we want to be careful, right? Because these behaviors, they do convey a lack of self-control, a lack of uh, self-discipline that is self-destructive. But it's not simply the world who has fallen into temptation on this, is it not? Why do you think it's so often that the Apostle Paul has to address this in his letters? Right, we think back to the book of Exodus, which is one of the most important books in the entire Bible for understanding how we relate to God as his people. And God delivered Israel from Egypt. He gave them the law at the mountain. And then what happened in Exodus 32? Right, the people made an idol. Okay, I want you to read Exodus 32, verses 4 and 6. It says, Aaron, the brother of Moses, he received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. They said, then he, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. They rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings to the idol. And look, it says this, The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play, which is a euphemism for sexual immorality. Right, the people, rather than wait for God to act, right, at this point Moses is up on the Mount Sinai by himself receiving the law, and rather than wait for God to give his revelation to the people and then to worship him rightly, they wanted a God who they could see and touch. They wanted one to be beautiful. Let's make him full of gold. And let's give ourselves over to the worshiping of idols and to other sins as well. 
right, that today we might want to do the same things, right? Rather than be patient for what God is trying to reveal to us, we might want to take things into our own hands. Rather than come to God's word or to the church or to a pastor for spiritual guidance, we seek out our own paths, right? Whether it's a televangelist on TV who is, you know, um, preaching a prosperity gospel in order to sell TV programming and ads, or maybe millennial influencers who commercialize their own authenticity in order to make a buck, and to encourage everyone to seek their own way, find out your own path spiritually, morally, sexually, without regard at all to the means of revelation that God has given us in his word. And I want us to pay attention to the end of verse 3 here. He actually calls out the lawless idolatry of the pagans. And I want you to understand something. Idolatry is a category that only Christians and the other faiths from the Judeo-Christian tradition hold. If you were to live in the ancient world and you worshipped your own household god or your own nation's god, it wasn't a problem at all that the other nation across the way had their own god. There were just were many. So if, we were, if the Roman government mandates that we worship Caesar, that's not a problem. We'll worship Caesar, but we'll also get to practice our own faith. One of the ways in which Jews and Christians in the ancient world offended their neighbors is that they said, no, that's idolatry. Right? That is something that is actually morally wrong to worship other gods. Then there's only one God. The insistence of monotheism was an aberration in the ancient world. But we believe that there is one God. And the reason I want to draw that connection is because the early church lived in a pluralistic world. There were many gods that people worshipped. There were many paths of life. And it's not that different from the world that you and I live in today. Okay, and it might have seemed like, well, it, this has just happened in the past few decades. It hasn't. It's come to us more in the past few decades, but this is always how the world has been. There are people who believe every kind of thing, and what's offensive to them isn't that we believe in a God, but it's that we believe that we are the only ones who worship the true God. All right? That other ways, other options, other alternates are not proper, and they are wrong in the eyes of God. So we need to understand that the witness that we bear today is very similar to that which Peter called the church to. And remember that obeying the Lord will always result in friction with the world. Verse 4 says that people will be surprised. He says, don't be surprised whenever you don't join in their sin and they, and they are confused by it. Right? And they mock you and malign you for that. I remember in high school, now I would never normally look at a high schooler as the you know, model of moral virtue. I'm not saying I was that. But in high school, one of the things that I was resolved not to do is I didn't want to cuss, right? I didn't want to say bad language. And I was on the football team. I was on a couple other sports teams. And so you can imagine that in the locker room, that was not a very popular position. And I remember actually being in the cafeteria with my friends sometimes, and they were trying to goad me into cussing. Just say this word. Just say this word. Just do it. Right? And now there are many, many things more nefarious than foul language, right? I'm not trying to say that was the, again, that made me the holiest high schooler there was. It certainly wasn't. But it shows how the world will not be content with us to live differently than them, right? The book of Proverbs shows this again and again. The young man who needs to grow in wisdom, he's running around with his pals and they're getting into trouble. And the word of the, uh, from Proverbs is, don't run around with them. If they're going to try to get you to commit crime and to indulge uh, Vices and sins and perverse exploits, avoid them. Don't hang out with those people. We have to be careful as the people of God. The, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, he told this story. Uh, there was a pack of ducks that were flying north in the spring. And this one duck, he saw some tame ducks on the ground. And he stopped by with them. And he noticed that they had a lot of food. And so he started eating it. And it was good, so I said, I'll stay for an hour. Well, that hour turned into a day, turned into a month, and by the fall, the ducks were flying south again for the fall, and he heard their cries, and he suddenly his eyes lit up, and he's like, I'm going to go with my friends. So he, he tried to fly, but he'd gotten so soft that by the time, he could only get as high as the, the eaves of the barn, and then he had to go back to the ground, and it was too hard, so he just started eating again. And every, twice a year, every spring and every fall, the ducks would fly over him and he would hear their calls and his eyes would light up, but he would keep eating. And eventually they flew over him and he didn't light up anymore because he didn't even hear them. He didn't join his old comrades in flight. There are a million ways, there are a million ways in which you and I might differ from the world. And while they might call us irrational or prudish or self-righteous or judgmental, 
we are to live according to the way that Christ revealed to us and what God has revealed to us in his word. We can stand firm in Christ in opposition to the world's moral influences because we're confident of God's victory in the future. Look at verse 5. It says, They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is important because while we might be mocked today, Jesus is who's going to justify us in the future. Right? The victory that Jesus won upon the cross in the past is something that we can stand firm in in the present because we're confident about God's future judgment. God will judge all humans who have ever lived. And our, our role, I want you to understand this, our role in the present is not to bring judgment upon the world. If they're living in sin, if they've not repented of their sins and come unto Jesus Christ, they already are condemned, is what the Gospel of John says. Our role is not to condemn the world. And we still pray, even if people are making our lives difficult, we are to still pray for their salvation and to act towards them in mercy and in love. Right, we can do this, but we remember that God is watching us, and God knows. So we can be confident of the love and care that he has for us. And we can be confident that those who believe this gospel, who heard it, who have gone on and died before us, that now they are alive in the Spirit, is what Peter says in verse 6. So we need to live out Christ's victory in the world, but also the second half of our passage today, verses 7 through 11, we live out Christ's victory in the church. We live out Christ's victory in the church. Uh, after uh, he said this in, in, in chapter 1, verse 22 to 23. He said, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So because of our salvation, right, because God has purified us by the blood of Jesus, because we are now called to be his people, he now is elaborating on what does it look like for us to love one another well. And he says, he starts off by saying in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. What Peter's trying to say is that you and I, we live between Act 5 and Act 6 in the biblical story. But between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that day whenever he comes again in the future uh, to, again, to return to the world, to judge the living and the dead and to f- complete our salvation. And so because we don't live at the end yet, but we live in between those two eras, uh, we first, the first thing we do is we resolve to pray. We resolve to pray. Look at the rest of verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. Right? Self-control is the opposite of the lifestyle that Peter described back in verses 1 to 6. Right? One that was living for sensual passions and pleasures. But we harness our self-control to the end that we pray. We are sober-minded. I think normally whenever you and I think of someone who's sober-minded... Right? We think of someone whose mind is not captive by the influence of anything that would distort their thinking. And normally we think of them as kind of a, just a cold, rational person at times. But again, both the self-control and sober-mindedness that Peter calls us to is directed to the end that we pray. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that prayer, we talk about it a lot, but to maintain an active and vibrant prayer life is not something that is as easy as it sounds. It takes self-control. To pause what I'm doing, to not pursue this form of entertainment, to uh, make sure that I'm taking time every day to be with the Lord in prayer. To be with the Lord in prayer. Second, Peter speaks of the necessity of forbearing love. Look at verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Right, he's specifically talking about a type of love that forbears, that endures with people, and forgives. Right, whenever you and I are sinned against, there's two feelings that we're going to have. We're going to be angry, and we're going to start harboring resentment. We're going to start looking for revenge. But that hatred and anger that we feel, it's like oxygen that fuels a fire. And what forgiveness does is it casts a wet blanket over that and takes all the oxygen away so that that fire can't burn any longer. Right? Whenever there's sin, it starts a cycle of retaliation and violence against one another, but forgiveness stops this cycle in its tracks. And when, again, we can even look at the cross of Jesus Christ as the death that put the ultimate stop to the cycle of violence in the world. 
Well, whenever he was sinned against, whenever he was hit, whenever he was mocked, whenever he bled, what did he cry out? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Whenever we forgive one another, whenever we feel the real warts and thorns of authentic Christian community, whenever we forgive one another, it puts Jesus on prime display. So we resolve to pray. We have an eagerness to, um, that we have, the, we have the necessity of forbearing love. Third, Christ, living out Christ's victory, we have an eagerness to show hospitality. An eagerness to show hospitality. Look at verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Uh, whenever you and I hear the word hospitality, we probably might think of like welcoming people into our home, maybe to throw a party or something, right? But the hospitality, Peter's not, he's, the one that he's talking about here, it's not the type of hospitality that would, you know, Southern hospitality to throw a great party that's going to get you on the pages of Southern living. No, instead he's talking about welcoming the stranger. That's literally what the word means in Greek. It's a compound word that means welcoming, loving strangers, So whenever you and I have open hearts and open homes to those who are in need, whenever we care for one another, we're fulfilling what God has called us to do as the people of God. And he he encourages us to do this without grumbling or complaining. Whenever we bear one another's burdens, right, it can get tiring, right? If you've ever cared for a loved one over a long period of time who's needed a lot of intensive care, you know uh, that there are days and there are moments when You've, you've about, you're about to the end of your rope, and it's hard. But Peter calls us here to love one another, to show this type of love without grumbling and complaining. And finally, is he encourages us to be determined to use our gifts for the glory of God. Look at verses 10 and 11. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That is just his multifaceted, looks different in a lot of different ways, type of grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It doesn't take us long to realize that God has gifted us in different ways, right? If we're going to have the next church fellowship, and I'm in charge of organizing it, let's just say it's not going to be one that a lot of y'all are going to want to come to, right? We'll have uh, styrofoam plates with hot dogs and maybe some little Debbie cakes for dessert. Uh, It won't be near as good as the great meals that our fellowship committee makes. But at the same time, some of you, the thought of this, as soon as these words leave my mouth, the thought of you coming up here to say something to the crowd, it's already making you feel sick to your stomach, right? Even just because I said that scenario. We're equipped in, in different ways. But what Peter is saying that regardless of what God has equipped you to do, use it to its fullest extent for the glory of God. Right? Leave it all on the line until you can't, until you don't have the energy anymore, and then trust that what God has called you to do, he will use for his own glory and honor. We don't do this for our own glory. Right? It's easy, especially if you have a public gift. It's easy to do things, even if you're not aware of it, for your own glory, for the praise of men, rather than for the praise of, and glory of God. But Peter calls us to these things because, again, we're living out Christ's victory in the church. And I think there's a progression, right? If we go back over verses 7 through 11, right, if we live with a resolved mind that this is the end of days, that, this is, uh, that we're in the final stage of God's redemptive work, then this must be met with a mental state that rightly apprehends the situation so that our prayers can take the proper place in our lives. And so having thinking rightly and and praying, that enables us to live our lives open to love one another that persists even when wronged. And once we correctly apprehend reality, we have lives centered on prayer and we are able to break the cycle of wrongs through forgiveness, then and only then can we speak words that are consistent with God's revelation and scripture, and we can serve with all the strength that he provides. We live out our lives displaying God's glory and Christ's victory in the world and in the church. I want you to remember this, that Christ's victory enables us to withdraw from evil and to pursue love in the life of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Father. If you're a Christian today, right, if you're in Christ, if you've trusted him, regardless of the worldly calendar that you count, remember that you no longer live a B.C. existence. 
You don't live in a B.C. before Christ world, but rather you're living an A.D. lifestyle. It is the year of our Lord for you. But I would have you consider how in your life, I want you to think back to that B.C. time. Right before you knew Christ or before you became mature in Christ, what habits, what attitudes, what actions, what lifestyle patterns characterized your life? And how did, once you started following Jesus, how did he deliver you from those? Right, what changed? How, if, if, if you're looking at yourself now, and let's just say for hyperbole, or not hyperbole, hypothetically, let's say you're 60 years old. And you're thinking, how, is, how has God changed my life from the time I was 25 years old to now? How am I standing more confidently in what God has done in Jesus? How am I living, a, living out holiness in a way that is easier for me to do today that was really hard for me to do 20 or 30 years ago? We want to live all of our life for the glory of God. And I think if we do this, right, if we live our, life, our lives for God's glory, then it's going to compel us to do two things. It's going to compel us, first off, to praise God, because we're not seeking our own glory, but rather God's glory. And the second thing it will compel us to do is to continue to be on mission. I was reading in my devotions this morning from Psalm 108. And as I was reading it, I was struck that having reflected upon God's glory, the implication that uh, David derives from this is that we should then proclaim his excellencies in the world. Look at Psalm 108, verses 5 through 6. David says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And listen to this. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. As God is glorified, it means for you and me, it means our salvation. God is glorified in the forgiveness and the redemption of sinners. And so let us continue to do this for the glory of God. Maybe you're living your life still in that BC world. You've never made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, right? And again, we're not talking about marking history now. We're talking about your own personal life. You've never believed, you've never confessed, you've never been baptized. Today, I would invite you to do so. There's nothing wrong with now. And indeed, the Bible says that we, none of us know exactly how long we have on earth. And whether God would give you one more hour, one more day, or 40 more years, I pray that each and every one of us would live our lives for the glory and praise of God. To him be glory and dominion, now and forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I, as we come to this text today and we think about your glory in our lives and we think about your reign in the world, we confess that at times it is easy and all too easy to compartmentalize our lives into different areas. Right? When I go to church, when I'm doing a Bible study, I think and I live and I act one way, I speak one way. When I go to work, I speak and act a different way. When I'm at home or when I'm with my friends, I live and speak a different way. But God, I pray that you would work in us and through us, God, not simply to be Christians when we show up and enter in the four walls of this building or the four corners of this property, but Father, that we would acknowledge your lordship in every area of our lives. God, that there wouldn't be any facet or any aspect of our lives in which we want to hoard and keep to ourselves and that will just shake hands with the world and make peace with it but father that we would remember and know what you called us to do father this begins with the knowledge of your word uh, sometimes we think we're living out what god has called us to do without any regard to what he's actually said and so i pray that you would help us to be a people who are committed to reading, to studying, to memorizing, to knowing, and to living your word. Father, this is also something that uh, we might endeavor to do, totally divorced from our relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. We think if we can just be good people, right? If I just live rightly, then that's all God wants me to do. And yet we never actually consider the fact that we live rightly only because you have saved us. We uh, have been ransomed your word said, from the futile ways of our forefathers, from the former times in our life where we didn't follow you. And so we don't do this in the, uh, 
we, we try to do it without your spirit living within us. But God, you've called us to, if you've, uh, having saved us by the blood of your son Jesus, you've called us to trust you by faith. And so Father, may we live resolved lives. Not to, uh, as, as, and as we live in the world, acknowledging that, the, that tensions abound, may we be resolved to follow you and your word. God, if there's anyone here today who doesn't believe or who has never trusted you for their salvation, or if there's anyone watching online, I pray that you would do, do a work by your Holy Spirit in their lives today. God, would you continue to draw them to yourself as you're drawing all of us to your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together our song of response. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, is now. Well, um, you may be seated. I have one more scripture reading for us today from the Gospel of John, uh, but it's, it's a little long, so I wanted you all to be able to uh, sit while we read it. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we are less than a month away from Easter. And so and to prepare our hearts uh, for that celebration, we're going to be going through the Gospel of John together in several different ways. Uh, in our scripture readings on Sundays, we're going to read through some key portions of the Gospel of John. On our Wednesday night Bible studies, we're studying through John uh, chapter 13 through 17 right now. And next week, I have one more way that I'm going to share with you, uh, but, but you've got to come back next week to figure out what that's going to be. But today, I wanted to read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Uh, it be a familiar story to us. But if you would, listen, for this is God's word to us, John 3, 1 through 20. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you, truly, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you with earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one who has ascended into heaven, except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, have a few announcements I'd like to share with you as we go. At first, I just want to say again, if you're watching online for the first time as a guest, or if you're here joining us for the first time as a guest, we'd love to hear from you and to um, uh, just to have a little bit of information about you so we can share more with you about our church. Um, and so if you're in person, we have a uh, visitor card in the pew in front of you. Uh, we'd love and would be honored if you'd fill one of those out. And as you leave today, we'll have our tithe baskets at the front and the back, and you can just drop it in there. If you're watching online, you could send us a message on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you there. Um, but a couple of other, other, other announcements today. First, uh, wanted to give everyone, we've been reporting on COVID for several um, months now, and I'm going to stop doing it because we're basically back to our current normal. Uh, but we are meeting in person on Sunday mornings, and uh, this Wednesday we'll have our business meeting as well. But I uh, want to re remind everyone and encourage everyone, if you uh, need to get a COVID vaccine, uh, that this c tomorrow in Nashville, if you are either 65 plus, regardless of your health, if you're 65 and plus, plus or uh, moving to phase 1C, that is if you have any um, extraneous health condition, you can schedule an appointment with uh Metro Health Department and, and the vaccines are available. So just want to make sure people are aware of that. Uh, the second thing is I wanted to share this coming Wednesday, uh, we have our monthly business meeting. That'll be in the fellowship hall downstairs at 6 p.m. So I hope you'll join us for that. And McKenna, our youth intern, is here to share a few announcements about the youth. Um, okay, so this, I think it's two or three weeks. It's on March 24th, I don't know if my, ah, there it is. Um, this looks a little crazy if you don't know what it is. Um, it's a video game called Among Us, and in the video game, it's pretty much like an over-glorified version of Tag. And so we are going to mock this video game, but do it in person. So this um, outreach project is going to be um, a big game of Tag, and I'm inviting all the students and hopefully having the students invite their friends to come for a night of fellowship and fun. And so if you know of any students that would be interested, and I promise you, you say among us, they're gonna know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, it's pretty popular. Um, so I'm going to have things, hopefully by next week, um, little um, pamphlet things that you can pass out. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer anything that you need to know about this. And it'll be at, at the CLC at six o'clock on March 24th. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks McKenna. Yeah, so we're excited about that youth event March 24th. And every Wednesday we have our youth group. This Wednesday they'll be at six o'clock in the CLC. So we'd love to have, uh, if you know any students who are, um, you know, would, would like to be a part of that, we would love to have them join us. Um, also next Wednesday, um, or not next Wednesday, next Sunday, a week from today, uh, March 14th, we are going to have a round two conversation of Daywood Shares. If you remember back in November, uh, the first Saturday, Sunday in November, uh, we had an abridged worship service that wasn't as long, and we spent the rest of the time uh, in an event where we were talking about uh, what brought us to Dalewood. Uh, this um, coming Sunday, or next week, um, the, Dale, the Project Thrive leadership team uh, who's been doing some revitalization conversations for the church. We're going to have kind of a part two of that conversation. It's not going to be as much conversation-based, um, although there will be a little bit of that, but it'll be more to report on what we've been discussing recently. Um, and so I hope that you'll be a part of that. I think it'll be a really helpful conversation for our church. And so um, just mark your calendars. They're, I know they're already marked. It's Sunday uh, morning. But uh, if we just want to let you know that we'll be having that next Sunday. 
Um, if you would like to be a part of a Bible study, we have those uh, available here at the church. They meet at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You can find out information about those studies at um, our website, dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash Bible study. We have Sunday school books in the um, foyer if you need some. Um, and if anybody needs a Bible, uh, we have Bibles available. Just come let me know. We've got them in the office. We have a couple over at the CLC. We'd love to give you a free Bible if you need one to, uh, to, for your own study or for someone else to study. We'd love to share that. And then finally, I'd like to let you know a couple different ways you can give to the mission here at Dalewood Baptist Church. You can give online at dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash give. Uh, or you can give it uh, in person. You can send it in the mail to 1586 McGavick Pike, Nashville, Tennessee, 37216. Or you can drop it off here during the week. Uh, that's fine as well. And if you can't do either of those things, you can give us a call at 615-227-7000. We'd be glad to have someone uh, pick that up for you. And again, if you're here in person today, we have, uh, we'll have baskets on the uh, back table or up here uh, that you can drop your tithe in on the way out today as well. Um, as we transition now to our time of corporate prayer, I wanted to share a couple of updates with you all. Uh, one is that um, Joy Fox has been at Skyline Hospital for a couple of days, um, and so we want to pray for her. She's feeling a little better already, but we still want to just pray that she would be well. Um, we want to pray for uh, Paul Watts. He uh, took a, sm a small tumble yesterday, and I think he's going to be okay, but we still just want to pray that he um, recovers well from that. And we do want to just, again, always be mindful of those in our church, again, who have long-term care needs that we want to pray for. And so today we're going to pray for um, Helen and Susan Cook as they continue to recover from their uh, hospital stays earlier this year. And we want to pray for uh, the Hickman Walker family. Uh, we want to pray for Kathleen in particular and, and Kelly Walker and pray that God would uh, bless them and, 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 um, and the health conditions that they have. So if you would, please uh, bow your heads with me now and let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful that you have, uh, again, called us here today to worship you, your name, to, um, to hear from your word and to speak to us. God, we want to lift up those in our church who are suffering this morning, who have needs, and we want to pray for them. We pray for Joy Fox, her sister, and, and just pray that you would help her lungs and her heart to all work together um, so that she can be healthy and well. And so we pray that you would help her to be comfortable while she's in the hospital, but also that she would um, get better soon. We, we pray also for Paul Watts and pray you would help him uh, to recover from his fall. God, we pray for Susan and Helen Cook and ask that you would uh, give each of them strength as they um, get better. I know that uh, we pray that every day would be better than the day before and every week would be better than the week before, uh, that they would be able to see incremental progress. So we, pray, we just pray for both of their health and, and ask that they would be well. And we also want to pray for the Hickman family, for uh, Ernie and Kathleen uh, and their children and grandchildren. We just pray you would, um, uh, God, be with Kathleen today. Would you give her strength? And we want to pray that you would um, give Ernie strength as he cares for her and loves her. We pray for Kelly and, um, and some of the health conditions that she's had through the years that still persist. We pray that you would, um, God, give her strength, help her to be well. And um, Father, would you provide for all that they need? Father, I pray for all other church members we have who might be not feeling well this morning and ask that you would, um, God, help them to recover and we want to pray for our community. We, again, are very thankful that COVID numbers have remained low for as long as they have. We pray that they would continue to get lower every day. Um, Father, we just pray that this illness would, um, again, as the vaccines are distributed and as people build up their immune immunities to this, we pray that the, uh, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our jobs, for the sake of our communities, uh, God, that we would uh, God, do what we need to do to be safe and well, to protect our neighbors from ourselves even, uh, but also that we would endure this long enough so that, um, God, as we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, we pray, um, God, that we would get there and by your grace and by your mercy. We're thankful that already um, we have several people who have had their vaccine and are able to resume a somewhat more normal life, and we just pray this would continue until we are able to resume uh, normal things around here. And again, not just here at Dalewood, but even in our community. Father, we want to pray for those in our community who have need today. We pray for uh, those who may be without homes, those who uh, may be suffering in other ways. And we pray that you would meet them where they are in their mercy. God, would you even direct us to them in order that we might use our resources. As, as 1 Peter 4 
uh, 9 said, that we would show hospitality to strangers, that we would show mercy and compassion on the poor, and that you would bless them and that you would provide for all their needs. Father, I pray that you would bless us spiritually as a congregation, that we would um, walk in step with the Spirit by our moral lives and actions, but even uh, that we would have a unity together uh, to do the things that you are calling us to do as a church. We pray for the youth group and are thankful for the studies they've been able to do this semester through the Gospel of Mark. God, we pray you would continue to allow them to have good time of fellowship and study together. And we pray for the event on March 24th that you would um, use it to continue to reach uh, youth in our neighborhood. Father, we want to pray as we do every week for our government leaders. We pray for uh, Mayor John Cooper, for Governor Bill Lee, and for President Joe Biden. We pray for all other men and women who serve at any level of the government, um, whether they're elected or appointed. We pray that you would give them wisdom um, to uh, make just and righteous decisions. Um, Father, we pray that you would um, help them as they have to navigate through um, so many difficult uh, decisions on a daily basis, some of which we would... uh, have a hard time fathoming. Um, So I pray you would give them wisdom. And as always, we pray that if there's any of these men and women who serve who uh, are not Christians, that they would come to the saving knowledge of the truth, Father. We do thank you for those who are Christians who serve in the government, that they would see their call, um, not simply as a call to serve their fellow man, although we do hope that, but as rendering their service unto you. Father, I pray that you would be with us as we go forward from... uh, these doors today and that you would help us to uh, have joy, that we would bear joyful witness to your glory uh, because of the work of your son and that we would do this with the spirit's power. God, I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. As we go, we're going to sing one final song together. So let's stand and sing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how a savior came from glory how he gave his life on calvary to save a wretch like me i heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning then i repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love was to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing fire have a great afternoon you're dismissed we'll see you next week